Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants from the garden to houseplants. And in today's video, we're talking specifically about microbes. This is going to be a very broad overview, but it's going to help you understand my future videos where I'm actually going to talk about specific microbes and the role that they play in the soil. This is a video request by so many of you. I can't even name the number of people who have requested this video. So here it is. I will also be getting into the arthropods, so the macro bugs in the soil system, but that will be in a separate video. In this video, we're specifically going to go over what microbes like to survive and the ways to provide it to them. So I wrote down some figures that I pulled out some of some of my textbooks, and I want you to just imagine how insane these values are and how important microbes are to the soil. These numbers are also going to give you an idea of some of the other things I'm going to talk about later in the, on in the video about how to kill off microbial colonies and populations and just how difficult it can be to completely nuke a soil for lack of a better term. In a pinch, that weighs no more than a single paper clip. Soil can contain 3 million to 500 million bacteria, 1 million to 20 million actinomyces, 5,000 to 1 million fungi, 1,000 to 500,000 protozoa, 1,000 to 500,000 algae, and 10 to 5,000 nematodes. Those values are insane. So you can see why they perform such important roles to our soil. The reason why you want microbes, the list can go on and on, but they provide very vital roles. And honestly, without them, soil and plants, they simply just would not exist. They help with the nutrient cycle itself. So converting organic material, your compost, for example, once it's been degraded into bioavailable nutrients for your plants. It's also very vital in the actual structure of the soil. So as our anthropods or our macro bugs go and chew away at our dead roots in our soil, the microbes come along and they actually completely digest that and turn it into molecular sized nutrients. They also are leaving tunnels or holes in those decomposed root or leaf litter layer areas. This actually provides an enormous amount of oxygen. When we look at fungi, we're talking about the ability to survive droughts and even some new studies coming out where we can actually have plants that aren't even related be able to communicate with each other. And then when we start looking at nematodes and even some bacteria, fungi, we have the ability to fight off diseases to some extent, as well as keep predators or nasty bugs at bay, such as ants or mealybugs or thrips, that sort of thing. So if you didn't watch my video on predatory nematodes, be sure to check that out if you're having issues with any soil-borne bugs, such as mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, that sort of thing. Anything that's basically doesn't have wings and originates in the soil, those predatory nematodes will take care of your issue. So how do we, how do we get more microbes? How do we get more microbes in an indoor plant setting? How do we get more microbes in, an, in a garden setting? And the number one thing is we need to provide it food. These bugs love sugar. They love sugar in all its form. They do not compete directly with plants for nutrients. And I feel like that's a common misconception. So when I talked about the Charles Downing, Doubting No Dig Garden, I mentioned that the compost or the manure isn't going, is going to result in a potential 
over application if we overdo the amount of compost and manure that we're using in the system. And people commented on that video saying, well, what about the microbes? We have more microbes because we're adding compost and manure and they need nutrition. So they're going to eat the excess and therefore we won't have eutrophication. And that's not the case. So microbes actually eat sugars. They like sugar, just like we like sugar. I'm going to do a video on actually molasses and we're going to do a garden debunking on that one. Um, whether or not it's true. I'm not going to tell you the answer to that. I think you're actually going to be surprised by the answer on that one, but sugar is the best way to go. And compost and manures have that sugar content. So they will actually cause an influx in microbes when we add it to our soil. We can top dress and that's usually generally the best method because what will happen is those sugars will leach down into the soil system where the microbes can then feast on them. We'll get into incorporating manures and compost and the difference in that a little bit later on when we're talking about no-till versus till. But in general, if we top dress our pots in our home or our garden outside, we are going to feed those microbes regardless of what's in there. Now, because we're feeding them, in my mind, and this may just be more of my own input, I believe the Di more diverse the compost and the manure you are adding, the better. Because obviously you're going to provide different polysaccharides, different sugars, and therefore you're going to encourage different types of growth of bacteria, bacterial and fungi, protozoa, that sort of thing. So you can diversify, do like a compost manure mix, or use different kinds of manure, or use different sources of compost. That's only going to work to your benefit. The second method, which is actually probably my favorite method, and I'm gonna let you in on some little tiny details here, but I'm actually going to be experimenting with the second method very heavily this year. I'm working with a company based in Saskatchewan. I'll put the logo here and I will link to them down below, but I'm gonna do a separate video on this all together, and that is cover cropping. Well, cover cropping is going to help benefit microbes based on giving it more carbon, so more root fibers entering the soil, which is gonna result in eventually more oxygen. But in my case, with the type of cover crop I'm going to be using, which is alfalfa, I'm going to have some nitrogen fixing benefit, which is going to be huge for my soil. And then I'm also able to control my moisture better. So I'm always able to have a baseline of moisture, which is beneficial to the micro population. So I don't have to worry about drying out as much. So cover cropping is very key. You don't have to use, and I'll touch on this in my cover crop video that I'm working on, but you don't have to use a certain type of cover crop. Um, there's obviously some that are better than others, and you can actually use a heterogeneous mixture. So where I'm just using alfalfa, you can use like an alfalfa, clover, maybe um, wheatgrass, like a huge blend of different items for a cover crop. The biggest thing is, is that every plant has its own rhizosphere. So it's different grouping of microbes underneath it in its root section that help with communication with the soil and nutrient needs and all that sort of stuff. So the larger the number of crops you put in the ground, the better. Mostly because you're going to have a more diverse microbial community. Now some Rhizospheres won't benefit others, but in general, you will have more active soil, higher rates of decomposition, and then obviously higher levels of nutrient cycling, and therefore more bioavailable nutrients for your plants, regardless of the type of plant that it may be. Number three is moisture. And when I say moisture, I don't mean soggy and wet, because when we get soggy and wet, we end up with anaerobic bacteria, anaerobic fungi and anaerobic microbes in general tend to be negative microbes. They usually fall into the root rot type bacteria. So we want to steer away from that, but we don't want our soil, regardless of the type of plant, even succulents or cacti, if we're trying to increase the microbial count, we do not want our soil to go dry. We don't want it to be bone dry. The lowest you'd want this to get would be a sponge that has been heavily wrung out 
you know that base moisture that's there that's kind of where you want your soil at at all times when we dry it out completely we kill off a huge majority of our microbes however there will be some residual microbes in there and because microbes reproduce so quickly to the tune of doubling their population approximately every 20 minutes in ideal conditions we're able to bring back those populations very very quickly so the fourth one fourth one being no till there's a few different trains of thought with the no-till method and how it benefits microbes. And no factor or no theory is absolute. There's always variability in it and you need to decide what works best for you. So the first one being that tillage amplifies compaction, which it does. And the reason for that is pretty simple. If I have I mean, I'm gonna draw a photo actually. So say this is my soil structure. I have my, you guys are about to see my expert drawing skills. I have my plants up above and we have our soil surface layer. And we have our entire soil profile down below. If we have a soil that's been untouched or untilled, the theory is, or the idea is, that aggregates begin to form. And this is a real thing. It's formed through glues. So soil glues is essentially what forms this soil structure. So because we have structure in here, we also have roots. As these roots begin to die, they begin to actually form tunnels. And these tunnels hold oxygen in them. Because we have a balance of oxygen and we have aggregates with holes in them, if we don't till this, all these little holes and these micropores will allow for water and oxygen to come through the system. This means we have higher microbe count because microbes need oxygen to survive. We'll get into that just a little bit later. Now, if we decide to rototill our soil, we've officially broken up all these little micropores in our system. And now we just have soil everywhere and it's all kind of laying on top of itself. We don't have any aggregates formed because we've blocked it up. So aggregates, actually next time you're digging in your garden, um, you pull out a clump and you look at the clump and you think, huh, that's really stuck together. That's actually stuck together by glues in the soil, natural glues that form due to microbes. So once we crush that, we get a fine dust. We obviously no longer have that structure. Also, if you look at these aggregates, you're gonna notice lots of holes in them when you're digging in your garden. Those holes, again, are from roots, dead roots, or for, from poten potentially anthropods, so larger sized critters. Once we have all these little powder stuff, we end up with very little aggregation and zero natural process that has been formed over time. However, what can happen. So in this system, we have very little to no oxygen. The initial days of tilling, of actually tilling up our garden, um, we're going to notice an explosion of growth. And the actual explosion of growth is due to the amount of air, the O2, we've injected into the system. So the amount of oxygen we've now injected into a tilled system is enormous. So we have a microbe explosion, we have a root explosion, so our, our plants are really happy. And this is really common when we have the uh, lawn, for example, a grass lawn, where we do those plugs and we actually rip pieces of soil out. You'll notice your grass does much better when you aerate it. And that's actually because you're injecting O2 into the system. The O2 helps not only the roots, but it helps the microbes, which helps with the release of more nutrients. So in a tillage system or in a system where you're tilling or you're doing the plugs, you will notice rapid growth to begin with. And that rapid growth is actually due to an injection of O2. However, with the no-till system, you may notice in some cases that your plants are starting to not grow as well. So if you dug a profile, you may notice that there's a compaction layer here. That compaction layer is like cement. And due to that cement type layer, which we talked about in a few videos now, and I'll continue to talk about, there's no oxygen and there's no water. So any water that comes in 
to the system will actually end up here and then it'll run off or actually will sit in the system, which will end up sitting in the root layer, which will eventually suffocate and cause an anaerobic environment, which is not good for microbes or for the plant roots. The second scenario that I've seen in actual systems on a larger scale, but you may have it in your garden, depending on your space and how much area you have to work with, is that in farming in particular, we end up with wet zones. So zones where water is sitting on top. And that's because that compaction layer or a clay layer is really high to the surface. And so what it's causing is kind of like a bathtub effect where the water is just sitting on the surface. The only way to stop both this lower layer and this upper layer water accumulation, both of which kill your microbe colonies by making uh, kill your microbe colonies, but also your root system by causing a low oxygen scenario. So a anaerobic environment is to till. So you have to go to this system in order to alleviate either one of these two issues. No till will work to your benefit if you're not noticing the first or the second scenario. If you're noticing the first scenario or the second scenario, or you may think the first scenario is happening, you're not sure, dig a pit, see if you hit a hard pan. If you don't, then it may be something else. It could be lightly reserved to an area too where you're ending up with puddling. Do not do a no-till system. You need to till the soil. You need to rototill it. You need to get in there with a shovel and mix it up because this situation where water's pooling, you're causing an anaerobic environment is worse than a tilled system where you're actually getting some action and something is happening. So that is something to watch out for. If you do not need to till, don't. Do not till. It's going to help your microbes colonies immensely. But if you're noticing water pooling or improper drainage, then you will need to till because you're still killing your microbial colonies. So the fifth one is actually mulching and this kind of goes back to the moisture and moisture conservation. So placing a mulch over top will help increase the moisture, which will then help the microbes down below. It'll also help remove some of the heat that may come, some solarization of the soil that may just naturally happen in say a south facing garden bed or in a garden bed that's exposed to lots of sun. It's going to help alleviate that increase in temperature. Now, obviously if you're doing method two, which is a cover crop, you can't mulch with it. I mean, you could, but you wouldn't be able to do a deep mulch or a bunch of mulch. So that's something to keep in mind. And the sixth one, which is common practice, but I don't agree with, is the use of pesticides, fungicides, uh, herbicides, insecticides. Pesticides is actually all encompassing of the three, but anyways, and then fertilizers, inorganic fertilizers. And the theory here is that because those are meant to kill or that fertilizer has high salt, you will kill your microbial population which is true. You are going to put a dent or dent, however you pronounce it in your country or your area in your microbial population. That goes without saying. But anytime in the field, when I studied this research papers, I've looked at just the amounts that I've, I've looked at this scenario, you will never ever just look at the values that I stated in the beginning of the video. You will never ever kill off your microbial colony to the point where you have nuked soil. The only time that you will nuke your soil is if you decide to bake it or you decide to solarize it. So, and solarization in the sense that you've solarized the whole system. I don't think pesticide usage or in synthetic fertilizer usage is any worse than the clear top um, organic forming method of solarizing the soil and heating up the soil. You are killing that topsoil layer of microbes in both scenarios. Luckily, in both scenarios, soil has so much living organic 
or living microbes in it that it will be able to reproduce and come back very very quickly so at the end of the day i think that both kill off microbes but that your microbial population will be able to bounce back regardless of what you're using now if you're fertilizing every day obviously you're going to put a dent in your 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 microbial colonies but if you're putting in a fertilizer every once in a while it's not going to be a huge deal they will bounce back remember they tend to double their population size within 20 minutes under ideal conditions so once that fertilizer has worked its way out of the soil you it's just going to start coming back very very quickly same with pesticides and that sort of thing i mean if you have a huge issue and you need to treat the issue because it's going to decimate your crop, you need to treat the issue. You can't sit there and be like, well, I'm not gonna treat this powdery mildew because I might hurt my microbial populations. Like me, and again, there's organic methods, but that's just something that what I've studied, I haven't really, I've never gotten hung up on fertilizers and pesticides. I think they have their time and they have their place. So, that's just my opinion. General consensus in the scientific community is the same thing that pesticides and fertilizers aren't going to nuke your soil in any way. There's still microbial colonies in those systems just based on how many that naturally occur. Pop culture, I guess you could say for lack of a better term, would have you believe that your soil is dead if you're using pesticides or fertilizer, but the studies don't show that. That's, that's maybe just me. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below. Let me know if you believe in the power of microbes in your soil. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.